it seems like right at the beginning of their civilization, they're able to quarry these 60 ton stones, uh, these 60 ton solid basalt stones out of the Sierra de la Tushla volcanic belt to their northeast and quarry them and transport them 90 miles away to this city and, and carve and erect these massive Olmec heads. And it's like they're doing this from the very beginning of their society. So for yeah. people out there who really have no idea what what their origins were and and who they were and what the civilization was like, can you just give the the download on on the Olmec people and and their base history? Yeah, yeah. So the Olmecs, man, incredibly ancient. It's it's the origins of Mesoamerica. Now the basics of Mesoamerica is basically everything below the Rio Grande. So below Texas is essentially the most northern edge of Mesoamerica. And it continues all the way through Mexico into Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and it kind of fades out as you get closer to Panama. That's essentially Mesoamerica. And, uh, and this has been my central area of expertise for quite a long time now. Uh, you know, it was, it was what I studied in college and got my, my anthropology degree in. Uh, and this was the world that opened up to me. I just, I'm fascinated by it. And it's, and it's infinitely complex. But on the Veracruz coast, which is to the west of the Maya realm, to the east of where the Aztecs will later be, it, there is a river that connects to uh, the Gulf of Mexico or the Gulf of America, as some people call it now. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's called the uh, Coetzcalcos River. You know, I actually get I actually get a lot of flack for that because I might I make custom maps. For my videos, and I still call it the Gulf of Mexico. And you I'm, get flack for that? Yeah, yeah. People will be like, "No, no, it's the Gulf of America." It's just and a like, logistical I'm like, nightmare. I'm though. like, I'm like, I'm like, guys, I, you know what? I'm just gonna stick with tradition here. It's yeah. been the Gulf of Mexico for like 500 years. It was fun to say. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not switching up because one guy says so. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, um, so, anyways, yeah. So. It's the uh, the Quetzalcoatl River connects to the Gulf of Mexico, and um, along this river, it's essentially like think of think of the Quetzalcoatl River as the Nile River that the Egyptians you know the Nile River gave the Egyptians their civilization. We did this whole rundown last time. It, it, it's it's not of the credit of the Egyptians, it's of the credit of the Nile. The Nile just gifted these riches to the Egyptians. So the Coetzcalcos River just gifts all of this fertile land to the Olmecs. And in fact, uh, I brought a group of uh, students with me in December, and we went to uh, San Lorenzo Tenochtitlan, which is the first capital, really, the, the, the central metropolitan area of the Olmec world. And it's way up on top of this hill. And as you look down the hill towards the Coetzcalcos River and these alluvial floodplains where all of their maize crops or their corn would grow, um, I took a photo of it, dude. If, you, if I were to show an Egyptian that photo, they would think that I took a photo of somewhere in Egypt. It's that similar. It's just, and I've been to other Fertile Crescents as well and looked at it and I'm like, oh, wow, these all have the same similarities. It's these low valleys where the river consistently floods and it has you know creates this alluvial fertile mm. plain and this is how civilization begins it's uh, just it was fascinating seeing that so um so the Olmec world begins at San Lorenzo Tenochtitlan. Uh, it's the it's the Fertile Crescent of Mexico. It's the most overlooked Fertile Crescent of the entire world. I mean, uh, where well, you have seven Fertile Crescents, Mexico is the most overlooked one. It begins with San Lorenzo Tenochtitlan about three thousand eight hundred years ago. So, uh, uh, eighteen hundred B BC, I should say. And so the Olmecs essentially. They get their rise from they have the they have uh, port cities as well that are actually on the Gulf and San Lorenzo is is inland a little bit along the river, and so they're sailing out on the coast and they're fishing. They have you know all types of resources from from their ability to catch fish as well as raise corn. So they so they're they're just booming. They essentially rise before everybody else and they just mastered agriculture before any of the other cultures in Mesoamerica even get started. And what's really crazy is it seems like right at the beginning of their civilization, they're able to quarry these 
60 ton stones, uh, the 60 ton solid basalt stones out of the Sierra de la Tushla volcanic belt to their northeast and quarry them and transport them 90 miles away to this city and, and carve and erect these massive Olmec heads. And it's like they're doing this from the very beginning of their society. There is no, from what we can tell through the archaeology, there's no lead up to this. There's no developmental period before they're able to do this. They're just doing it from the very beginning. Right, so we could look up uh, just, I don't know if you have, my eyesight's not that great, but just Olmec heads or something. Um, yeah, they're insane. <clears throat> it, it's How crazy. How much did you say crazy. they weighed? So this is, okay, so this is a really, this is a really cool mystery about the Olmec heads. Um, so it looks like a pulling guard. <clears throat> oh, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it, it's beautiful, man. And there's, uh, there's 17 known heads, but there's actually three more heads that most people have never seen, but they're made out of sandstone and they're not even human. They're like, uh, wear jaguar half human half jaguar faces yeah we can we'll get, get into this it's really really cool um this is actually something that connects to south america and peru by the way okay um and i think it has its origins in the amazon this is kind of my other area that i'm looking into um <clears throat> so you asked about how much they weigh so get so get this so the maya exploration center uh of which I, i'm a member of this is run by my mentor dr ed barnhart on one of his Olmec expeditions, he had a nautical engineer that was traveling with him who was fascinated by this idea of how did the Olmecs transport these heads? So he created this algorithm that you could put in, uh, in I'm not exactly sure what it was, a software or a site or something, where you could input the theoretical weight of your Olmec head and the, the and the theoretical size of your balsa river raft. And he found that if you made the raft too big to go down the narrow stretches of the Coetzcalcos River and you put a five-ton head on that raft, it would flip the raft and sink it. Okay. So if, the engineering has so, to So started. going back over this, if it's too long and too wide to go down the narrow stretches of the river to actually make it to the city, it's already too big to go down the river and you put a five-ton head on it, it would sink the raft. The smallest head is six tons, and the largest head is 52 tons. So nobody knows exactly how these things were transported. It's just all archaeologists have quietly known. What's, oh, what's your do. idea? Aliens. Could be. Well, UFO came down. See, that would be the easiest way to do this. That's, that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> it makes the most sense. But see, the problem with the alien thing is we have to figure out, like, you know, the aliens come down and the Native Americans are like, please, we're starving. Our children are dying. We need something like penicillin. And they're like, no, 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 no. You we'll teach you. How, you need these rocks. Right. We'll lift the rocks for you. Because then they can pray to something. Yeah, then they can pray to something. And have their soul saved. Yeah, yeah. Because the real life happens after that on Earth. It could be. See, could be. I already got all the holes filled in. I know you do. You're not going to plug these. I think you've been. I think you've been plugging the aliens every episode. Not every episode. A lot. There's a lot of misinformation out there. <laughs> but when we look at when we look at the ancient world, there's some stuff that I'm like, come on, you know. <clears throat> Man, you know, you know what I actually, I actually, I actually have to agree with you. Um, you know, I kind of like when I think of like little green men and spaceships, I kind of roll my eyes at that idea. Um, but at the same time, then I also find myself like as a like a religious person, I find myself studying ancient people and I see the bizarre things that they come up with and the things that they believe and the things that they you know have this conviction about. Yeah. And, you know, there's entire eras, there's two entire eras of Maya civilization where they give no credit to any single person for anything and they dedicate every temple to a god right. and never lift up one person. It's like they do it all for the gods. The Egyptians seem to do everything for the gods. You know, there were Greeks who literally actually believed that the gods exist. Well, I mean, most Greeks did. It was only the philosophers that started kind of questioning whether or not the gods existed. Um, but, you know, you see so many ancient cultures go so far out of their way for their gods. It just makes me think like, okay, what is actually the answer to this? Is, is, it, is it that 
is it that people are just looking for something like they're looking for they're looking for an answer so they kind of just make something up do they make it all up to be able to control the people beneath them or does it make more sense that these people were so convicted by their beliefs because what they were experiencing actually happened to them mm. and it's like what's the line between what's the line between an ancient person taking some kind of natural hallucinogen and interacting with a deity while he's in that space right and and an alien what's it what's the weird. line that you draw there you it know? gets weird man and and like and like okay can you know i'm saying this as a very self-aware christian uh where does like christianity fit in this you sure know, it's it's a fascinating thing. And so I so I agree with you. I like I laugh about the alien stuff, but then I also have to remind myself, like, well, you know, I my my hot my hot take about the ancient world is that I actually think it's more likely that it's not all made up. Thank you guys for checking out this clip. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the like button on this video. It is a huge, huge help. And if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode, that link is in the description below or right here. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and X by using the links in my description below.